start the show. For Thursday, September 1st, 2017, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Welcome back, everyone, ahead of this long Labor Day weekend to celebrate you, the workers out there. <laughs> I'm Norm, joined by Jeremy. Hello. And Kishore. Hello. I, I already have something from the corrections department. Mm. Oh, whoa, whoa. Let's, let's get right to it. Corrections, please. It's Thursday, August 31st. And oh. I wrote the wrong date. Oh, wow. Already, met, already setting a tone for this podcast. I'm just a robot. I just read what was on the document. For, let's let's start the podcast all over again. No, 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 no. <laughs> hey, Thursday, August thirty first. You guys didn't weren't, weren't you, they've been yelling at their radios, at their iPods for for minutes now. Seconds, seconds, seconds now. Uh, how's your weekends, guys? It was good. I had like a. Uh, it was the end of the first week of school, so I did a lot of family based stuff. How about you? Uh, we well, we talked about it a little bit yesterday on Still Entitled, but we were at a convention. Yeah, you were Crunchyroll, right? The Crunchyroll Expo. Now, um, I pulled my family because uh, I was curious about this, and uh, I asked them when I say Crunchyroll, mm-hmm. what do you, what, what do you think that is? I tell you, it's a it's a content channel. Yeah. Um, what type of content do you think it is? And none of them could guess. But it's anime. It, I knew that. You knew that. I knew that. You knew Crunchy that. Crunchyroll is pretty primarily. famous. It is, yeah. But I don't know why it's anime. Why, I, I why don't know. Crunchyroll. I, I guess the roll, like 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 a sushi roll, like a hand roll. Is maybe. that the idea? I don't know. I, 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 that, that part bewildered me a little bit. But it was CRX, Crunchyroll Expo. Uh, we had a booth there, uh, and we brought a bunch of stuff. So, um, you know, as we chatted with Adam and Will, we brought the Totoro costume, which was a big hit. Uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, people have waited in lines all weekend to uh, to take photos with Totoro. And Adam, nobody wore it, to be clear. No, right? no, no, yeah, no okay. one was in it. A lot of people ask, like, is Adam in that right now? <laughs> is he is he incognito the He's whole like time? He's like prank, pranking people. Yeah, is, he, is that going to come alive at some point? Oh, we could have made it talk periodically. That's got to be a project in the future. Okay. It, the the costume he has doesn't have a mouth. It's just a yeah. Uh, it's not a big smiling Totoro. Uh, but lots of people hugged it. Um, it was it was really great to see, you know, fans of all ages really embrace it. I don't think I've seen such a visceral response to a uh, like a character um, um, since. R two D two or BB eight the or Wally <laughs> Wally wow it, you know when you know our friends uh, Mike McMaster Mike Seno have built Wallies and they've brought them to Comic Cons and D twenty threes and other conventions and people run up and you know that's an animatronic Wally a robot Wally RC Wally they've made and people really have a visceral reaction to that Totoro same thing and it works because even though this isn't an animatronic Totoro in the movie Totoro is kind of this he just stands by the bus stop you guys. Is passive. He's kind of sitting there, and you just walk up and sh- shake his hand and hug him. And passive. Well, come on. They yeah. takes him on. A, they take him on a flying adventure at the end of the movie. <coughs> yes, yes. But Totoro is kind of a sl- lumbering, slumbering beast. Kind of sl- sloth-like. Yeah, very sloth-like. Um, so yeah. for our friends that don't know why Tested was at a anime convention, yeah. why, why it was Tested at the Crunchyroll? So we have a partnership with them. Uh, we make a, a lot of our premium content goes out on their Verve channel. And if you want to go to uh, see the stuff, it goes out there real early, uh, vrv.co slash Tested. Um, a lot of our build series and science series want, shows that um, Jeremy and Kishore hosts are on uh, that channel. Um and so we brought projects from those channels. So this uh, is what we didn't talk about in Stone Titled. Um, people loved seeing some of these projects, whether it was Simone's Macintosh cosplay that she wore at Silicon Valley Comic Con. She hollowed out a, an old Macintosh SE uh, to the Pi Score. Yeah. The Pi Score was a massive, massive hit. Did it work? It worked flawlessly. Wow. So I, yeah. I, 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 uh, Pi Score is a Raspberry Pi powered um, emulator. 
that is inspired by one of these. This, if you're watching the video, this uh, this old what is it? Coleco. <coughs> it's a Coleco like, 1983 tabletop arcade game. Yes. Yes. And yeah, Sean and I made a uh, 3D printable version that runs Raspberry Pi and plays all your old favorite games. I mean, so many people came up. I had Donkey Kong running on it because it was perfect for that, cool. that landscape screen. And uh, so many people were like, oh, where can I buy that? Uh, where, anyway, like, how much does that cost? Gotta make it. And I was like, you can make it. Watch the video. The files are, are yeah. out there. We'll tell, we can show you how you can make one. It's really not that expensive if you have access to a 3D printer and you can buy all the electronics for you know, under 100 bucks or so. That's what we're all about. Yeah. So that was a that was a big hit. We had um, other props that we've uh, you know the creepy fig was there. People, lots of people had fun poking creepy fig. Um, Bill Duran's uh, District Nine a replica. A Can you wear that creepy fig? Is it Technically, a wear? Technically, it is a mask. So we it's it's on a core right now, but we could peel it off and you could put it over your face. It's Ugh. kind of gross and heavy, but Ugh. it does work. As a mask. Did you meet some tested fans? I imagine, yes. I imagine there's some crossover where people <coughs> are interested in Crunchyroll and other properties of theirs, and they would wander over and discover tested. Mm-hmm. But did you also meet tested fans? Totally. A lot of people, um, even like longtime tested fans that we had met at other conventions, they just happened to be at this show, and they came up and we like, shook a lot of hands. Where's Jeremy? Where's Kishore? Yeah. And yeah. A, lot of, a lot of where's Adam? He was there. He went. He was there for a signing <laughs> oh, on yeah. Friday. A lot, a lot of where's Adam? Um, and, or what's he wearing? What costume is he wearing this time? Uh, but it was really great to chat with some people. I, I cool. built, uh, so we we built a Millennium Falcon Bandai model kit, uh, yours, Jeremy, with the fiber optic lights. Uh, we on, yeah. on, on the show, yeah, yeah. And uh, I built mine over the weekend, so I just I that just, was your weekend project. Yeah, I wow. just I stood there. I, you know, I was sitting there for like nine hours on Saturday. So oh, you did it at the show. I did it at the show. Wow. And I chatted with people. People came up. What are you working on? I'm, like, oh, I'm just building a little Bandai Falcon kit. It's super cheap and it's really fun to build. And here are these, these custom electronics. So I I did. Wow. The, the, what we do on the show live and chat with people about it. And did you finish it? I finished it. LED kit? LED kit and all. Fiber optics. Fiber optics. Wow, dude. Nice. Yeah, I just didn't paint it. <laughs> so paint it that's it. fine. Yeah, it was like a five hour assembly. I did all the decals How's too. How does it look? It looks great. Uh, it just doesn't have the, uh, the the paint shop that I'm, I'm going to put on uh, later. Uh, but the, the convention was a ton of fun. Um, I talk a little more about it on Stone Title, but like just the, the crowd was really, it was a really good crowd. Um, really good artist alley, and, and I th- we'll probably be going to more of those conventions in the future. Cool. Uh, but the long weekend is this coming weekend, Labor Day weekend. Uh, you guys have big fl- plans for Labor Day? I plan to take my family to Santa Cruz mm. to celebrate the beginning of the school year. We, we go down there and go to the boardwalk and have Wear a good white. time. Wait, wait. You go to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk? In the warm California sun. <laughs> boardwalk! I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's great. You guys do that all you want. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the the theme park boardwalk. Uh, San, Santa Cruz is a beautiful city. It is. I love Santa Cruz. It's great. And there's a we go to a what's the name of it? I forget. There's a, our favorite breakfast spot is there. We have a routine that we do. Mm. So we just we love it. All right. You go play the art at the arcade. The the games. I, I'm a pinball guy, as you may know. <laughs> I've, pretty, I've met you. The pinball games there are not great. They're not. They're kind of notorious. <gasps> bad bad conditions. Speaking of pinball, at the Crunchyroll Expo, I uh, met up with Freddie Wong. You know Freddie Wong of Rocket Jump? Yeah. He does those YouTube videos. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, he was a guest there. And we chatted a bit. And he had a, a pinball project idea that he mm. wanted to do with us. Mm. I can't say exact. I want to say what it is. Uh, but I'm going to type in our show notes so you can uh, react a, a to it. A pinball machine that jumps up in the air. I approve already if it's a um, pinball project. And But it's, it's highly ambitious. Oh, I'm teasing everyone out here mm-hmm. uh, with You're it. You're teasing us because you haven't written it yet. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that sounds fun. Uh-huh. Yeah? Yeah. Possible? Yeah, yeah. There's actually, somebody made a, a shirt of that, but, like, the actual design. Oh. Yeah. So it's, it, oh, we're so cryptic it's, right now. It's in the air. Oh, okay. That That's what he pitched. I know it'd be, it, it, it's a challenge. We'll maybe take it up. Okay. okay. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. All right. Uh, Kishore, what about your labor I'm plans? I'm going to Dragon Con tomorrow, oh. which I am so excited about. My favorite con of the year. Oh, I'm so jealous. And I am... I am definitely up in my cosplay game this year. Uh, I'm on I'm on seven panels, most like science panels, mm-hmm. and I'm doing a project with the EFF where we um, constructed a, a nine foot cardboard TARDIS and sort of outfitted the inside. So when you walk in, you're able to call your congressperson about net neutrality, 
uh, where the which uh, has a comment period that's just closing right now. Uh, but I'm also cosplaying as uh, a few different things. I'm I'm resurrecting my Mayor McCheese uh, cosplay, and I've added a few key features to it, including a new vest and some yellow spats to it that I'm really excited about. <laughs> what is, that, is it mustard? What the 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 yellow spats? No, no, spats are um, are these. Uh, uh, coverings that go like over your ankle onto your uh, shoe that hook to the bottom of your shoe. Oh, I'll be. Yeah, it, it's very fanciful. Only the highest of highest mayors wear these <laughs> <laughs> these devices. Very no, nice. but I, I got I went down the well of like being like I got to build an accurate Mayor McCheese now. Wow. And so I've uh, I've re-engineered that whole thing, and I'm doing my first mashup cosplay, which is going to test every cosplay skill I have. Uh, available to me, which you're, is not very much. You're not going to r- reveal it. Oh, I can tell you what it is. I'm going a sideshow Barb, so oh, I'll mash up of sideshow Bob nice. and Barb from Stranger Things. Oh, wait, I, I love Stranger Things, but who's Barb? What? What? <laughs> what? Wait, wait, what? Oh, that was Jeremy. not just uttered on this podcast. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! Who is Barb? Barb is the best friend who gets s- s- lost in. In the upside down, and she, oh. you think she dies? She was, oh, she was the opening. Barb. Yes. Uh, at, <laughs> at, oh, sorry at, about our pronunciation. At this, <laughs> at the swimming pool. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, that's right. Oh. Oh, poor Barb. Yes. So, okay. Great. So sideshow Barb is is full yellow. So I'm doing a whole whole yellow face paint and hand paint, and I have like a trapper keeper. I have. Oh a, wow, dude! Really? Nice. You have to eBay that? You found a trapper yeah, keeper. Uh, That's uh, great. Again, trapper keeper from the '80s, and I have the glasses, and I have a sideshow Bob wig that I've been, you know, sort of making my hand. <laughs> I have uh, Barb. Uh, a frilly, uh, frilly neck shirt. That's great. And That's uh, great. mom, mom jeans. Okay. Oh yeah, I got some serious mom jeans. So that not, not only is it a mashup, it's also a gender bent. Which is really cool. Yeah. It is. I, I mean, like there's it. a lot of things happening in that costume that are not, <laughs> that aren't going to be pretty. Wow. But Photos. I'm excited about the Pixar I'm didn't most happen. excited about the glasses and the trapper keeper. Yeah, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, the big lot. That's in the defining characteristics. And then, um, yeah. Two last things. Oh, uh, there's also PAX going on right now. Uh, that's uh, in Seattle. PAX West, the original. PAX Prime. Um, not going to be at that either, unfortunately. But uh, looking forward to seeing all the the fun videos and and announcements and stuff from our friends who are going there. Kind of jealous about that. Me too. Uh, last bits of from CRX. Uh, speaking of Stranger Things, so we have the Pi Score, and I sent you this picture uh, on our Slack channel. But their kids love flocking to the Pi Score, and one kid was hovering around the Pi Score. Throughout like all of Sunday, yeah, looked just like Dustin from Stranger yes. Things. Okay, he curly did. hair and everything, and the way he talked, I was like, "Are you, are you in Stranger Things cosplay?" No, I think just, I think they just nailed kids right. I mean, he, he hasn't watched it. I hope like kids would be freaked out by Stranger Things. I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Well, I'm saying the creative Stranger Things nailed the, the yeah, I kids, get it. I kids get it. today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, my car uh, update on my car problems that we talked about like a month ago. I'm driving my car now. AC is not on. And, you know, San Francisco is always like 50 degrees in the summer, right? Even though it's like you drive an hour and a half outside of San Francisco, it's 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, driving back from Santa Clara where this convention was, Mm -hmm. it was 95 degrees. Mm. My phone overheated. Your oh, phone overheated. That's My why phone overheated. You sent a picture. It had an actual thermometer. Yes. On the screen. Well, now the thermometer wasn't uh, like an actual uh, a gauge. No, I so. know that. I know that. But it was an indication that it needed yeah. to cool down. So I was on a phone call. I was chatting on a phone call, and then suddenly the phone call dropped out. And I'm like, "What? What happened?" And I touched the phone, and one, it was scalding. Oh my gosh. The phone, and two, the entire screen of the phone had switched over to a temperature warning iPhone needs to cool down before you can use it. They stop the cellular radio cuts off. You get no service immediately. You do get time. You can make emergency calls, but like Bluetooth is all connected, and you can still take still take screenshots. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. Wait, were you doing multiple things? Oh, I was just on a phone call. The <sighs> screen wasn't even on. Yeah, but your car See, was that's broken. Hard to AC. See, that's the problem. You're using your iPhone to make phone calls. Yeah. That's where you the, made your yeah, mistake. The, the power sucking, battery draining, overheating phone calls. You're using Bluetooth to make the call, too, so there's additional Extra radio. radio. Usage. Yeah, that's right.
All right. All right. Uh, we have the Game of Thrones finale this weekend. Well, now, when you say that, it's just the season. There's one more season, right? Yeah, okay. there, there is. And, and it's funny. We had a watch party at my house, and there are a few people who thought it was the end. That was it. What it do you mean? Final they, they came over, to, and they thought it was... It, they thought they were prepared <laughs> mentally. Like, this is it. Okay. The, the final confrontation. Uh, but no, you get six more episodes in maybe like two years. Yeah, about two years. It seems like it might not be till 2019. Seriously? They haven't yeah. started filming it yet. Oh my God. Do they want to wait for the books? No, 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 no. no. The books, they've diverged. Like yeah. you queue up the think pieces saying that George R. This is George R. R. Martin's time to reclaim his his story because the TV show has gone downhill, jumped a shark, <laughs> and it's time for the books to reclaim the Game of Thrones name, the Song of Ice and Fire. How quickly you guys turn, man! Everybody loved Game of Thrones, hey, and then like there's one episode, and everyone's like, oh, I jumped the shark. I don't think it jumped the shark. It's over. I think that the season, if you look at the season as a whole, there are many high points. There are many great build of moments of fun. Like, the, the build up, the payoff is never as great as the anticipation, I think. Mm. The anticipation always in our head. Like the journey is so much more rewarding than the. And, and there were great payoffs. It just felt a little rushed. The, and beyond it being rushed, like I, I think Game of Thrones was built on surprising turns, like losing key characters early in the season that you thought were main stars. Or the first episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, it wasn't the first episode that we lost. That main character, no, no, but yes, but a yes, yes. Uh, so we st- we lost a little bit of that aesthetic here, and, uh, and also because at this point they've killed off so many. Like, I think some people are disappointed that the show did more fan servicey things and weren't true to the brutal nature of the 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 realism of of the writing. Now, realism only goes so far when we're talking about a world that has dragons and flaming swords. Uh, but like, when people make bad decisions, they pay for them and in this past season plenty of people made bad decisions really like head scratching plot points and no one really uh, had to pay for it Thoros uh, of Mir but you know yes that, I mean he had it coming with that man bun for a long time <laughs> you may you wear that man bun for multiple seasons somebody's coming for you I gotta just tell you that the fact I didn't know we had a two-year wait before the f- conclusion yeah plenty of time to rewatch it now now I can actually catch up at a good pace this is great news yeah I wonder is it this is gonna be a big event two years is a long time to make people wait well the the rumor is that the final episodes final six episodes will all be um movie length 90 minutes long. Holy cow. Every episode. So you're essentially going to get, uh, you know, 10, full episode. C, 10 episodes worth of, in, but told in these six stories, six parts. All right. And I think, I don't know why, they're also calling this like a season seven part two. It could be contractual. It could be because like, so they don't have to renegotiate yeah, salaries. Right. And, what, and What'd you think of the finale? Are you happy? I'm really happy. Really? I'm really happy. I was happy until the last 30 seconds. And I was like, come on. That I thought that last scene was ridiculous. No, okay. I don't even remember the last scene, the very, very last, like the oh, oh, the, the big, the big, uh, okay. the big climactic. Yeah, that well, was, it was phrase weird. that. Um, and then there was the big CG of the big CG scene. The big CG scene, and there's all sorts of of science discussions amongst our friends on how that would be possible. I like that conversation. If you if you are, uh, have seen the episode or are not averse to spoilers, follow Kishore and Annalee, <laughs> and they had a great conversation about the, the science of that last scene. Yeah. Um, uh, I also finished the Defiant ones. Okay, so you watched the second two. Or yeah, the last, the last two. two episodes. Last two episodes. The last two are not as good as the first two. I agree. The The origin stuff is more interesting. And also that last, last episode is just an ad for Apple Music. Yeah, it does. Well, it kind of starts out that way. And the whole I, thing ends. I feel like I was like I was compelled, compelled, compelled. And suddenly like they, they pulled this, the, the, the wool over my, yeah. my eyes and like, ha, huh, but this is really a just an ad for Apple. Why did like it, James Corden come on and be like carpool karaoke with the characters or something? Once they, they had okay, the one scene where Jimmy Iovine at you know the yes, beats got bought by Apple, but they they talk and then they they have a literal scene with him sitting with Apple marketing and he's like having like this like ad like conversation about Apple Music and getting subscribers sign up and how great their product is. I'm like I don't I don't care about this. The whole thing was like an ad for the two of them. I mean, it was really like a an image boost for it was a, a, almost like a control piece for what they want people to see Jimmy and Dre. And as. it's not like they didn't shy away from some of the like the <laughs> the darker parts of their past. 
and they ha- right. face some of that stuff on. I'm glad they did that, but at the same time, I, I felt like it was intentionally positive, that it was not an objective oh, doc- documentary. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there some honest moments there, but I wanted to hear about the, the Beats monster cable breakdown. That was glossed over in one sentence. Yeah. And then none of the critiques about Beats quality... Like none of that stuff. <laughs> no, dude. No, no, no. But it was interesting to see how much, how much of that was manufactured, how much of that was fabricated through throwing the, that, the throwing, culture. Yeah, put, exactly. The like manufacturing put, of culture, putting them into music videos and and, and, and sports. Even, like even Eminem said, you know, I don't want to spend another half a day to get this shot of um, a, of a headphone in my video. Yeah, right. And I liked that that was there. That that honesty, like like that Eminem came out and said, you know, let's stop with this headphone stuff. Let's get right. back, Dre. I want to see your album. Yeah, I like that. And and if, if it ended up being like this because they both work for Apple now. They are part of the, the oh, yeah. Apple ecosystem and leadership. Uh, if it really want to make be an Apple ad and talk about how they fit within the because that's a big question. Like the, the, they never talked about the skepticism that the public, the media, um, the, uh, the the technology uh, columnists had about why this could make sense, they addressed that very, very, they glanced over their relationship with Steve Jobs. And I thought that could have been a fascinating parallel. Yeah. The, the Iovine Steve Jobs friendship. Did they have enough, like, footage of that? Tons. Of, of this Jobs Iovine stuff? I mean, I'm sure they had, they, they had photos, but they, they had a lot of stuff in this documentary series that we never would have seen before, like outtakes or music videos. Um, like because, recording sessions, and yeah. I asked because Jobs was notorious for not allowing even some documentary crews yeah. uh, to capture much of what was going on behind the scenes. But yeah. they didn't even bring in people from their lives, right? I don't know. I I, I, I like overall, the first episode. Yeah, better. yeah. Uh, still highly recommended. Um, okay, other pop culture stuff. Uh, you guys watch the Blade Runner short film the official blade runner short film it, it's a prequel this is crazy to, it's it's basically blade runner 2036 ahead of the blade runner 2049 film and i actually if you're excited about the film i don't recommend watching this because i think it gives it starts to give away stuff and it takes away from the world building that i think you're going to get in the movie itself um just really the only thing i'll say is the you get much more of the Jared Leto character, mm. and that guy is scary. Is That's all I need to say about him. This is a much scarier character than what he portrayed with the Joker or anything else like that. I wish we had Joey here because I'd, I'd love to ask him his thoughts on this because Joey is famously in the Tuskegee in the office uh, averse to spoilers and trailers. He wants to go into the movie experience, what's block, uh, what's book ended by that two hours, whatever run, run time the film is, that experience as pure as possible. Um, now, ahead of movies coming out, uh, there's trailers, obviously, so there's behind the scenes document uh, featurettes, uh, but it's this new trend now. And these, the, the last three movies that have really done this are the movies produced by Ridley Scott or directed by Ridley Scott. The Martian did this, um, Alien Covenant did this, did and this now, no, and Bla- did this exactly. I didn't know the Martian so did this. The Martian had those vignettes about the uh, the crew before they left. Yeah. For their Mars mission, no the tour of the spaceship. They had the confessionals to camera. We hmm. didn't care about that as much because we had all read the book. We read the book. book. And, and we didn't care about... I mean, let's but rephrase this that. is different. We didn't care about that spoiling the film experience. Yeah. But we, I watched that ahead of the film because I wanted that was enhancing the story. And it got me more pumped up and jazzed for the film. For Alien Covenant, they did a couple of vignettes. Like they, uh, they had... Um, um, I don't want to go into too much spoilers. But they had David... Um, and his journey to where he gets to where he is, and they also had the the crew of the Covenant, their their last dinner before they go into hibernation. Right? They had these vignettes, and those are directed like this is directed by Ridley Scott's son, and those were, I think, not critical to the story, but definitely added more to it. So, as someone who's averse to spoilers and averse to watching trailers, do you watch this? Do you watch these? Yeah, I, I don't think you do because not be, if, if it was a pure prequel. Like, just a pure, like, no general relation to the film, just sort of doing some world building. I can see a a reason to watch this, just to get you sort of more immersed, because it's been a long time since Blade Runner. Like, maybe you need some acclimation. But this has one of the key 
characters right. in the film. And so as they were writing the film, did they segment it out and say, okay, there are elements of this character that we don't want to reveal in the movie or want to have the moviegoer um, experience and have mystery around, but we're going to reveal it in this prequel thing. If it's Yeah, I don't think we, like, you know, having watched it, I don't feel like I walked away with probably something that's going to spoil anything, mm. but I walked away with a sense of who that character is. And that in and of itself is a spoiler yeah, to but me. What you said about him intrigues me enough to want to go see the movie now. And I think that that's sort of the point of them having made this. They, they, not, they can't bet on just the, the trailer. On Well, no, on just the... Just the moviegoers that remember the film from the 80s going right. going to see it again. They right. have to hook a whole new generation of audiences. Right. And this is how you do that. And, and it's it's beautifully produced. I mean, this could be part of the film. These are scenes that could look like they could have rolled before the opening credits. They could have, I mean, but they're not a part of that two hour, that, that run time. They're not part of that script. It's not part of the, the it is ancillary material. Um, it's really interesting that they got these big name actors and they produce these whole short stories. They're going to do three of these. Um, and have them, and, it, and they, they're all in support of the opening box office. There's totally a money component here because I heard um, from a reliable source that worked on something like this that you typically only can get about a half hour of content um, that features main actors from the film before you have to pay them their full rate. Mm. So they're, oh, you mean like promotional for yeah. promotional stuff? That's interesting. So, like, uh, so there are certain things like if you haven't seen the Tropic Thunder m- documentary on the mockumentary inside the film, yeah, they basically shot a really long time for that, um, but had to cut it down to thirty minutes to make it work. And that was all in support because of otherwise, the film. yeah, because Robert a, Downey Jr. is in it and stuff, right, right. and they would have had to pay him his full rate had it been feature length. Where, where do you watch that documentary? It was on the Blu-ray? the the blue the DVD Blu-ray. We'll we'll watch. It is it is really hilarious. Tropic Thunder's on uh, Netflix right now, by the way. It's ten years old, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's ten right. years old. That's crazy. Such a funny movie. So good, so good. Uh, we gotta go back to Stranger Things, looping back around because um, we're all building up to that season two. They, so, Jeremy, there's this character Barb. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot that she was a fan favorite. Uh, if you live in uh, Chicago, uh, there is a club bar called the Emporium, and they have now themed their bar the Upside Down Stranger Things themed. They they release some pictures. Is too. that illegal? I, I, yeah. <laughs> I definitely don't think it's licensed by Netflix uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But you know how many people have used that that logo font to do so many things. And Netflix doesn't seem to be taking any of this stuff down. It's pretty explicit in terms of their, their theming. Like they have a yeah. part of their bar that looks like Winona Ryder's uh, home with the, the Ouija board. Uh, and, the, and the Christmas lights. And the outside, they have like the offenses that go into the Hawkins National Laboratory Department of Energy. So it's pretty good in terms of theming. I like the, it. I, I would totally go to a place like this. So if you live in Chicago, we have, this is a tip from a fan, um, a listener out there. So it's thanks for the tip. We're not going to unfortunately be there, um, but I, I, I would love always seeing themed themed restaurants and themed um, themed bars. Shy town. Yeah. Um, ah. Ego. Yeah, I know. There's a drink. Hey, Jeremy's looking at a drink that has a that a looks quarter, like a pineapple. Looks like a pineapple, but it's a quarter ego waffle in the drink. That's pretty good. Yeah, uh, you know the uh, the sheriff in Stranger Things. Um, I forget the name of the actor. Um, oh yeah, he's great though. Uh, the sheriff in Stranger Things is one of the rumor. Is he the rumor lead or is he the confirmed lead? Um, in terms of a uh, he, David uh, Harbour. He is. In, I think he's confirmed the lead confirmed. for. For, for playing Hellboy. Hellboy in the new Hellboy movie. Okay. Which, have you talked about that on Still Untitled, like Adam's feelings about the Hellboy reboot? I think he has a lot of feelings, and he's trying to distill them into something we can talk about. But you didn't bring up Hellboy to talk about David Harbour. There is no. news this week. Yes, and I, I think it's totally worth talking about. So there's a character um, in Hellboy, uh, I think a detective, um, I'm trying to figure out, find out the name. Uh, a Japanese character, uh, uh, Ben uh, Daimyo. In the comics. In the was, comics. He was an Asian-American character. And he's going to be, this character's going to be in the new Hellboy film. And they had cast an actor for it. And the actor is uh, Ed Scrain. 
he was in the Dead, uh, Deadpool movie. He was the the main antagonist in the Deadpool movie, the one on the motorcycle, um, and he was also, I guess, in Game of Thrones uh, before being recast. Um, but uh, he's a Caucasian actor, and he took himself out of the movie because he said that as a, he had issued a public statement saying that uh, there were some casting concerns, and he thought that it was not right for him to take this role of a Japanese character. I mean, generally it was well received from the audience and people thought highly of Ed doing this. Um, is it weird that I don't totally believe this? You don't, you don't think it's a sincere... I don't think... I think there's probably more so going cynical. on. There's a lot yeah, of, I know I'm a little cynical There's a lot here. of money to turn down. Yeah, I mean... For I an don't, actor who you know is, isn't just like in every movie, I'm not sure like how many roles... He has lined up for him. I exactly, mean, it's, a, it's a high pay. It's a big, high profile gig. Look, right? I want to. I want to be wrong that that he was doing this for the right reasons. But a, he doesn't strike me as like this mega fan of the source material, um, where he would do this. But uh, it, you know, it, it seems like Hellboy is a franchise that's set up for multiple films. So I'm surprised. Like I think, to regardless, walk out without there being some internal conflict as well. Regardless of the sincerity of the statement the words the, the the statement itself i think is the the best statement that could have been issued and the most like the words Agreed. meant something and they, they you couldn't get a hint of of um of of a, 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 of a, any dishonesty in it in, in that in the words themselves who knows what on behind the scenes yeah that's all in your head dude uh, uh, fair but uh uh the i think i retweeted the the statement it, it is it is beautiful so mm. uh I wish him well, um, and I, I don't know what this means for the movie, though. I don't think it means that much. I mean, I think there are plenty of actors they could get in to fill that role, um, you know. And I, I think they'll. I hope they spend their time casting the right person, and there are plenty of talented actors that could fit that role. Um, so I'm still looking forward to it. I, I think it'll get them some goodwill. I think Hollywood, I mean, the cynical part of me does look at the past year and look at some of these other controversies in um, the past year, whether it's from Ghost in the Shell or Doctor Strange. I don't think those are the problems with those films, and I don't think those end up being problems with those films. But I And I don't think that if uh, this actor would have stayed with Hellboy, that would have made that a bad film. But I do appreciate what what's happening, and um, I think it's going to give that film some goodwill. Right on. Uh, one last bit of pop culture news, and it's going to bleed into the technology gaming news. I wonder how many people are going to be talking about this at PAX. Uh, we have closure, potentially. Oh, Half-Life 3 confirmed? Half-Life 3, 3 confirmed dead, potentially. What? Well, so, all right. I, you got to fill me in here, because I couldn't be bothered to read this thing. It's Really? It's so long. Oh, you know? my. <sighs> and okay. I, I wanted to play it. Well, let's, let's let's give the the context. Ten years ago, now Orange Box was released, right? And that's more over ten years ago. Uh, Orange Box was Half Life Two Episode Two, and Half Life Two had two standalone three hour, three to four hour episodes that they, they it was like the first big major triple a foray into this episodic gaming right every couple of months or every six months every year they would have a new part uh, uh, to extend the story without calling it the, the full-on sequel it mm -hmm. maybe made sense from a development standpoint but at the end of and it's been 10 years we can spoil this at the end of half-life 2 episode 2 which is itself a fantastic game yeah um uh, which Will had famously said was the worst part of Orange Box. Well, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. But uh, it was it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. The other two parts you didn't mention were Portal, Portal the original TF2. freaking Portal. Yes, we're getting world and TF2, which had, was the you know the PUBG of the day. Yes, um, changed their respective genres. Uh, episode two left left on the cliffhanger. Major character died. Alex's father, Alex Vance's father died, um, and uh, there was a teaser about going onto a ship in the uh, in the Arctic, um, and and it was a big cliffhanger, and mm -hmm. we we're waiting for episode three, Half Life Two, episode three, and the speculation among fans, ten years going on, ten years into it, is that maybe we're never going to get episode three, but it's gonna it's gonna um, turn into Half-Life 3. Half-Life 3 would wrap up the story. They would have blown it out. They'd failed in Valve. Had, they, they, their interests were elsewhere. They just didn't have time to work on 
uh, Half-Life 2 Episode 3. It had been mm -hmm. too long. They couldn't use the same engine. It was going to be Half-Life 3. Well, Mark Laidlaw left Valve a while back, and he was the writer on Half-Life 2 and the episodes. And so he released, and I don't know about the politics of this, like well, whether what was kosher about it, but he released a blog post. Apparently he, he released this blog post within days of his NDA expiring. Ah, okay. So it's all good legally, but... Yeah. Okay. So he... And it, even within the blog post, he didn't use the characters' names. He, he renamed everyone, all the characters and all the events. and, and uh, But you could follow along in this and get the story structure, all the beats for episode three. Mm. And, and, and people wow. have since, very, very quickly after this came out, took that blog post and just converted all the names back. So you don't have to do the mental gymnastics of converting, uh, converting names and locations yourself. And for some people, it was cathartic. You finally got a sense of where these characters would have ended. And it would have ended a big chapter in the Half-Life universe. Was it for you? Somewhat, yes. Yeah. It's interesting. See, for me, I, the other reason I didn't really read it is because, of spoiler, I don't really play video games for the stories. Uh, it's, <laughs> I know. I know. Maybe that's too old school of me. Maybe I'm too locked into, like... You know the '80s and, and early '90s, and that's high, <laughs> high score. It's, it's not high score. It's gameplay. It's like that, it's how does it feel in order? You know, when I play the game, and am I experiencing a sense of advance? And I, no? I love that line, though. It's like the reverse of I read Playboy for the articles. Like I, pl I play I, video games I for the video, action. Yes, not, I, the not, story. not the story. I couldn't tell you the first thing about the story between World of Warcraft or Diablo, despite having played those. It's just about the mechanics, and I to get into that. And first-person shooters, for sure, have those in droves, and I love that about the Half-Life series. I would have played it day one, regardless of the story. The I, characters, I you, felt, you didn't feel a connection to the characters. Half-Life was the first like piece of game to really experiment with that, but I would say you know it was, it was okay. But for me, it was more of just like you know Half -Life, I, I mean, Half -Life, icing on the cake. The the, the one of the bi best things about Half-Life Two was it fulfilled the promise of an NPC that you had empathy toward. You mean at the end? No, the Alex Vance character, yeah. was, uh, your sidekick oh. throughout the game, yeah. was amazing. The facial animations, like you cared yes. about like, this character. I did. And there are plenty of games since that have characters you care about, but this was one of the first. Uh, and then and the dog character. I was going to say the dog, even maybe even more so, because it didn't. It lacked the uh, Uncanny Valley. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> still, I couldn't tell you anything about their storylines. Yeah, I but don't know. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's why. There are a lot of people that feel differently, though. That yes. are very invested in yeah, the, the storyline. I think that's one of the best internet jokes out there is that Half Life 3 will just show up someday, though. So, does this put some closure on it for you? Or just Mark's version of it? I'm still holding out. Yeah, that's right. I'm still holding out hope. One day, yeah, you gotta. In, in, in VR, in some capacity, there will be a Half-Life 3. And that gets back to like the tech, and the, one of the reasons I play these games is that Half-Life 2 pushed these like the physics uh, elements in games uh, further forward than we'd seen before. Yeah. And uh, we, I had hoped that the next Half-Life would uh, do the same for VR. So, I don't know, we'll see. Oh, we're going to move on now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did any of you get in on a SNES pre-order? Nope. Not interested. <laughs> Not interested. <laughs> no, I'm so plus eight today. Uh, I have the NES one. And that's NES classic. Why, why don't you? Like, now, granted, I, it comes with two controllers, and you need all those extra buttons, buttons. to play the SNES games. Yeah. Nonetheless, the, the NES one Which plays, you can hack. plays the SNES games. You can hack it in seconds, Yep. and it plays all the same stuff. So, no, I'm good. The, the NES is the one that's my generation. It gives me the nostalgia boost. Uh, I don't need the SNES one. Did you get a pre-order? I, I wasn't able to. Oh. So it went pre-ordered in two places, GameStop and Best Buy, and it it didn't work out for either. You can pay triple on eBay. Yeah. No, not no, interested. No, not interested in paying two hundred over two hundred dollars for a SNES Classic. I did find out that eBay has a policy where they don't allow price gouging on pre-orders past uh, like uh, over a certain well, well, time. Over a certain time or or like monetary there's value. certain no there's a certain uh, amount of time before the pre-order is released that they won't allow 
um, sales. Of how that, can they? Uh, I mean, that's that's a weird eBay policy because how can one confirm the pre order and then yeah. two, that's acknowledging that th- this is uh, just a gray a, a gray market aftermarket price I, gouging. Yeah, I I hate the the market it even exists. I think they should not even allow sales of a pre order item. Yeah, if you put something on eBay, you should be selling the actual object, not the promise of something. Uh, I disagree. I think this is a fair market move. People are allowed to sell pre-orders, you know, to one another. It's nothing illegal about that. eBay just lets people discover what the fair market value is for this stuff. Yeah. My, what a I, capitalist so, here. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem is Nintendo, really. And, and the retailer is not giving enough supply, not meeting that the is demand. Exactly. This, is, this feels intentional now. Like with the Nets, I feel like they may have gotten caught off guard at this at the demand for it. Not with this one. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I feel it feels like there's somebody somewhere in an office they're like, you know, let let's put out a hundred thousand less than, than we know that is out there. I agree with and you. And see what happens. I don't, why does Nintendo <coughs> do that? Manufacturing um, market demand. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that went on sale last week we didn't talk about was the Xbox One X. Any interest here? <coughs> this is one I can say no, I have no interest in. I don't have the Xbox. I don't own last Xbox I owned was the Xbox 360. So no, I, I don't. Have, I have a new one of the Playstations. Yeah, that's all I need. Well, no, nope, no interest. And there's no, no, there's no VR announced for. Especially it. like all of us invested in essentially new PCs for our VR system. So it's hard to invest another, you know, five six hundred bucks in an Xbox system that is underpowered compared to this. To, to those systems just for the convenience of the living room play. Yeah. As, what's the uh, response been? Is, um, has it undersold? Or? I think people are, they haven't announced anything. Oh, okay. And it was, unsurprisingly, I think people are hedging and waiting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the general consensus is that it's going to be more tech. Like it's, you know, it, the PS4 Pro is already out, but mm-hmm. this, if you're going to wait for a Pro machine, this is the one that's it's more powerful. Yeah. Uh, but I think people, they don't have this, the TVs. To run the 4K yet? Yeah, like 4K TVs are getting cheaper, but if you don't have that, you're not going to see the benefits. That's right. Yeah. All right. Um, I I just want to remind listeners that today, um, when you're listening to this, August 31st, is the deadline for comments around net neutrality to the FCC. Uh, so far, they've received 21.9 million comments on uh, maintaining net neutrality, which I think all of us are unabashedly in favor of of, of uh, maintaining. Uh, and it seems like, you know, the, the hints are that the FCC will probably wobble on net neutrality this time. So um, actually putting in your say seems um, very vital and important at, the, at this point. I am shocked at that number. 21.9 million comments is a lot. Not bots either. It, no, not bots. And I'm also surprised at the penetration of net neutrality in just uh, the public arena. I went to uh, a, a cell phone store the other day, and there's there's signs and flyers up about net neutrality in, in, in those stores. So uh, I'm impressed with how much this has got, gained traction into the public sphere. It's an issue everybody should be in favor of on both sides of the aisle, on you know every political disposition. So th- th- maybe that's part of the reason why a company can put up those signs. I I guess so. Yeah. I, I just surprised because it always felt like, especially when I first heard about it, which is what like six, seven years ago now, or something like that. More than Five, that. yeah. Um, that it felt like just like an insider, yeah, kind of uh, <clears throat> issue. Exactly. And it's really sort of crossed that that bear. So, anyways, I hope people put in their comments so that we get. Past 22 million. Yeah, good, 22. <laughs> and after you fulfill your comment, you can walk over to your nearest Whole Foods. <laughs> save a bunch of money and now. Save a bunch of money. Feel good about that. Have you, either of you walked into Whole Foods since the merger went through with I Amazon? Don't, I don't shop at Whole Foods. I, don't, I got the money to shop at Whole Foods. I, sh- I shop at Lucky's and Safeway. Uh, I used to shop at Whole Foods when it was close by. But we do have one that we go to occasionally. Um, I understand you can buy the Echo. Yes. In, in Am- <laughs> so I walked in. Because I was so curious yeah. about this, because there's all this press about they're going to be lowering prices on on basic staples like bananas were going to go down in price. Thirty like, percent, yeah. And uh, somebody from I think The Verge did like a side by side comparison 
of their shopping Sunday versus Monday. Literally, wow. it's a price and slashed. It was like twenty dollars savings on a hundred dollar bill. That was basically like stuff what? like buying like salmon and bananas, just buying gr- like straight up groceries. Gunther Nothing. said he went to his local Whole Foods and they were cleaned out of. Chicken. Yeah. Of bananas? Yes. Oh, chicken. <laughs> yeah, so I went, uh, uh, my closest grocery store is a Whole Foods, and so I, I walked into it, and so the Echo advertisement is so out of place. It is so hilarious. It's like basically it was by the flowers. Like, have you thought about buying an Amazon Echo and today? And they, they have a whole crate full of them? You just grab one? No, was, there was just a, a lot of sighted. It's uh, a yeah. tower. They had they yeah. them all like a pyramid of yeah. Echoes. Like, bow down to our your new <laughs> god now, the uh, Alexa, and then enjoy your savings. <laughs> Look, wow. I, I'm never going to argue about like price cuts because Whole Foods operate at a five percent uh, uh, margin, and Amazon really operates on two percent, and so they're just bringing down the margin. Loss leaders. And but how how soon it, before the quality the, goes down? The Echo thing was pretty funny. It can't go down. Like that's what they live on. That's why they exist. The, the quality. Yeah, they, the, everyone thinks of them as having great quality produce. That's just a perception thing, though. I don't know. They actually do have good quality produce. I mean, you know, Trader Joe's. I, that's the other place I shop at. Trader Joe's a lot. Yeah. Trader Joe's just rebrands other major name products, and yeah. they can't disclose what who their uh, um, who their uh, sources are. Uh, but it's the exact same thing with the Trader Joe's box and a Trader Joe's bag. That stuff's hit and miss. You got to find the the. The blue ribbons and Trader Joe's, uh, but so the other, I want to ask though: Is the discount only for Prime members? Not no. at this point. It's everybody. It's everybody. But the Prime. So this is the brilliant thing: is that the Prime membership is going to be the rewards program, the and there. Pri- so your Prime membership. Oh. Is going to be like whether you use Amazon, whether you pay by pay by app or pay by credit card or whatever. Your Prime membership is going to give you extra discounts, and there's it's going to be a day where there's going to be like a Whole Foods, Costco style Prime Day. Right, you already have Prime online month. Prime Day. They're gonna do like Prime Day. Only Prime members can shop at Whole Foods these days. Clearance, everything on <laughs> massive discounts. You can't get in the door without a you Prime membership. You can't get in the door. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I I think what's uh, interesting about it is there'll be stuff that that I like, like Amazon Locker. That's the thing that could be at a Whole Foods now. If I can do Amazon Returns, yes, exactly. Oh, like all like of these drop off products. That I've returned at yeah. a Whole Foods as opposed to going to the UPS store or going Actually, to. There's the, I don't know if you've done it recently, but re, now the only free way to return something to Berkeley. Amazon is in freaking Berkeley. It's an MLK Student Union Berkeley. Now, if I, went, I was still going to school there, it'd be easy. <laughs> I'm not going to go all the way to East Bay or do a return. Do it at the Whole Foods. Then that'll, that'll make me go to the Whole Foods. Yeah. So I, I think if that's the kind of integration we're looking for, I think that's going to be amazing. The other thing that I'm looking for is what we saw in that Amazon video where they there was the like no cashier checkout kind of thing. I'm looking for like some sort of like halfway where you come in and somehow like scan that you're a prime member and it bills your Amazon account as opposed to having to get out. Oh yeah. You, you could just use your phone to scan yeah. everything as you shop and then just leave. Yeah. So, something like in that, in that sort of area I think could be interesting. You too. do that at Apple stores. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Right. You just walk in the store. You do your shopping on the app beforehand. You walk in. You put everything in the grocery bag and just walk out. <laughs> they just trust you. Security guard's just like, I no. guess he's okay. No, I, 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 he weighed the chicken himself. That's <laughs> yeah. salmon. That's, that's a pound. Looks like a pound and a half of salmon. Yeah. Uh, the question is, could they integrate uh, digital assistance in any way? Could the Alexa service actually work between your home, it's where it's already entrenched, to the shopping on location shopping experience. How could that work? So this this is where it gets murky for me because Whole Foods has this contract with Instacart, which is a grocery delivery service. And so, but I could imagine if you went and shopped at a Whole Foods and you did your shopping, you could reorder it, basically be like, reorder what I got at Whole Foods last week Uh and have it delivered through some service. That could be interesting. Well, through just, voice. Just Whole Foods delivery service is yeah. interesting. Yeah. But voice integration in store? No. Hmm. Like, I can't imagine what uh, Alexa would do to, to sort of help you when you're in the Whole Foods. I just want to point out, I don't say that word anymore on the podcast. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm say, sorry. I'm sorry. I say Echo. Yeah. Just okay. Just letting you know. Everyone who's getting their activated devices, it's not my fault. Computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it was. Just, I think it's just everyone's realizing this is a, a smart move for them. Um, it, it's always been how fast can Amazon become Walmart? 
before Walmart can become Amazon. Oh, that's funny. And mm-hmm. Walmart has bought up like Chet.com and, yeah. and, and a lot of other mud cloth on the retailers. So it's it's becoming the biggest, re- who can become the real biggest digital and uh, physical retail giant. I just think there's so many possibilities for them to capitalize on this that it, it'll be interesting to see which, which they choose, you know, because they can't choose everything. They can't to deliver suddenly deliver groceries to the to a city like that, that's yeah. a lot if they want to do that that's a lot of money that they have to throw at that they can't just become a return center they can't uh you, you can't maybe have same day pickup maybe from there that you couldn't get at home there's so many different things they, they could do i'm curious to see what their choices are mm-hmm. did you guys see the the echo update no oh, oh yeah you mean multi-room yeah multi-room audio i tried it did you try it i didn't try it let's hear it. so describe what it is of course so you know, like, uh, what is it, Sonos, the home mm-hmm. uh, audio system, they have for years now offered uh, multi-room audio. So you play a song, and it plays in sync, which is crucial. Between, like, bye, be- bye, bye, in sync that way? <laughs> <laughs> but you, it must play in sync and the Backstreet Boys. And if through every single room, uh, or whatever rooms you have your speakers in. And uh, so Amazon unlocked that yesterday for Echo users. Uh, so now you open up your app, you go to settings, you say, create a, uh, a zone, or I forget what they call it. And then you add all whichever echoes you want to that to that list. And then you also give it a name. And there's some presets like upstairs, downstairs, bedroom. And uh, so then you can say device, play, uh, you know, Backstreet Boys upstairs. And it will then do that through all of your speakers. Connect to it in that room, in that zone. In whatever you've zone, done, so you yeah. could do your whole house. Right. You could do whatever you want. You, I suppose, you could even do like across, you know, houses. If does that work? You even carry like a little identifier to walk through the house, and as long as you're on the same uh, network. Yeah. Yeah. So and then and it is in sync. Like that's what surprised me is that mm. I, I didn't even think it was working because the sync was so good. It didn't do any room mapping to compensate so, for Doppler effects. <laughs> <laughs> no. So wait a minute, just to be clear. It would just play on every speaker. Yeah, in in the correct sync. So it's not like when you walked in the room, it would pick up from no, where the other one left. That's off. interesting. No, yeah. no, no, no. It just it's like a party mode, mm-hmm. so that you you're having people over. But it's all pulling from the same source. How? Why is that a difficult thing? Yeah. Well, I it's the sync. But it's, the sync is just like if it's literally they have the timings on their machines. Yeah. I mean, so it's just, it's interesting because I mean, playing MP3s in general, like even like getting MP3s to go from one track to another that was... That used to was, be the, the biggest thing. It's like a skip, Yeah, non-skip exactly. Like, that track, was a challenge. Yeah. Like the fact that they can now not only get everything synced up, but playing together uh, the same so everything. So a, a lot of people have dots which have very poor audio quality. So did you feel yeah. like the experience, even though it's synced up, is still not great because the speaker quality in the Echoes is Ooh, so variable? You judge your parties, people are walking in, and like, oh, that's a dot room. It's a dot room. I'm no. not hanging out in there. I, we, I used uh, two dots, an Echo, and a show. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is definitely a difference with the dots. No yeah. question. However, you can plug those into speakers if you want to yeah, boost that's, the audio that's quality. that's fair. Um, I was impressed. I think that this that it's a success. I'm I'm happy they added this yeah, feature. I'm actually pretty hopeful they can do the walk in technology because on the show, mm-hmm. it it uses that front facing camera to see when somebody is in the space. I did not know that. Yeah, it's creepy. Uh, it's not something I realized was there, but it has a screensaver on it that just will show the time as default. But when you walk into the room, it'll wake up and bring up the image. And so, like, I totally like caught it doing that watching you yeah (laughs) so it's clearly looking for movement which i think can portend some interesting stuff down the road it's also creepy as hell but i mean yeah i think that uh i don't know i I have mine on do not disturb Mm. oh so i'm not gonna drop in video conference i turned off drop in i yeah i I don't like that it's constantly suggesting what i can say to it so i just have to do not disturb just shows a clock that's all i want all right i go through some phone news um this actually could fit in the VR minute, but we're going to talk about it now. Google effectively has killed Tango, the Google Tango. Mm-hmm. So remember, there's this initiative that Google set up for uh, depth sensing, room mapping uh, with a, a specific uh, limited number of phones that had depth sensing cameras. Lenovo had a, one of these phones, uh, and they had pushed out to developers all out of their a- a- ATAP program. Uh, where the uh, the modular phone was also being developed, that was that's been since killed as well. Uh, but uh, Tango it worked, right? There were some apps that did it. You can have you can have this special phone with this, these two depth cameras, and you could have you could see like you could play a virtual game where you have 
people walking around, uh, virtual characters walking around your room. Much better fidelity than uh, previously with other AR apps. Well, it, we never used it, but did, I, I used did it. you? Oh, yeah. cool. Oh, yeah. I, I never used it, but what my impression was it did great room, uh, like uh, room map, mapping. mapping. Yeah, so you so, could move the phone. So, you know, like uh, AR kits on Apple side has been out for a while, and like Snapchat had the AR kit app where you, the hot dog, you know, dances around your table, but it only works to a cer- certain extent. Right, like if you went under the table or you walked around, like you, we didn't remember where things were. Right. Well, Tango it actually did mapping, and you, you could move the phone almost any direction around your surface, and it would have virtual objects every surface that but, you wanted to. But you needed specialized hardware in the phone in order for this to even function. Yes, and what we're realizing now with things like AR Kit is that there's a good enough aspect to single camera or even two camera phone systems, two optical camera phone systems. You don't need a laser sensor, a scanner, you don't need even an IR blaster for many of these instances. And this week, Google announced AR Core. Now, the problem is that AR Core isn't Tango. It's a completely different team from the main, it's built out of the mainstream Android team, not their advanced, uh, the ATAP project. Hmm. So there's new, there's, it's just an SDK right now. It only works with two phones, so still it's a limited number of phones, the Galaxy S8 and the Pixel phone, but they expect this to be a mass market, like daydream-like uh, mass market capability. And it looks pretty good. It is, it's their version of ARKit. Does it seem to function as well as ARKit? I haven't used it in person yet, yeah, yeah. But, but from the videos they've shown, yeah, from the reviews I've read, hmm. people have used it on, on the S8s. Uh, it, the SDK, they say, taps into a couple things. It uses the IMU, of course, and the cameras, so it does... Uh, you know, motion tracking on certain f- surfaces. That's going to be the quality is dependent on your image quality and how much moving you're actually doing. Uh, and so it does some environmental mapping, horizontal surfaces, tables, uh, okay. floors, kind of like AR Kit. Well, um, we haven't used AR Kit either. Just from the videos I've seen. Yeah. Uh, and then it also does light estimation. So it will look, look at the optical image and say that, oh, it looks like your light source, your, the sunlight is coming from this direction, so oh, allow this, the developers to tap in the SDK and render the virtual characters so it looks like it's in that room with you, Neat. which I think is important. Uh, there was an interesting Reddit post once we started to see a lot of these cool ARKit videos surface, and uh, somebody from the Android team showed up and said, I, you know, we know that our technology is better. Tango is better technology than ARKit, yeah. but Apple has won this because we lost sight of the market. Right. You know, the, the Android team was so focused on perfection. The Tango team. I'm sorry. Yeah, the Tango team was so focused on perfection that they've uh, lost sight of... The mo- the, the fisheye, all that specialty hardware. The, they, ma- the, the mass high market. Bar. Yeah. yeah. They lost sight of getting these into phones. Yeah. And it, the processing has been good enough. The algorithms are now good enough that you can do this stuff without the specialty hardware, without the time of flight camera, the IR blaster, and the, the wide angle camera. It's just what Elon Musk said about, about uh, cars. He said, you know, if y- you can figure out how to scan the road just like a human does, but with more eyeballs, everything is there. You can do everything optically. Right. You don't need radar. You don't need this LIDAR. LIDAR or LIDAR. Right. Right. There's a good enough aspect yeah. to it. Um, so that's that's a little bit disappointing for people who had bought Tango phones. But that, hopefully those developers who are working on Tango apps now have other that can tap into this AR core. And um, and if in a year it's more than just the handful of phones and it really, you know, this is the same thing for Daydream. We don't know what it's going to be like. We're in a year since launch. It's not really mass market now. Uh can these things be mass market? And I think AR is going to be pretty compelling. It doesn't require you to put on the headset. Like AR in this way, right? Not AR looking through a transparent screen, but AR looking through the phone screen, holding your phone out. Yeah, It's not true AR, but it's good enough, and it, the impact is still there. You know, Pokemon Go proved that. Yeah. Yeah, but I wonder, like, is this really going to improve the Pokemon Go experience? I don't know. Well, that's not the killer app. Yeah. I don't, but, like, we've seen AR stuff for years with, with QR codes, mm-hmm. and it's always been gimmicky. But the applicator right QR codes require the, the 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 marker. Yeah. Without having the marker, if it works in majority of surfaces, yeah, yeah, yeah. it could be the next communication tool. I wonder the if, the, if there's going to be a killer app for the phones, like before we get to the whatever the wearable is. It's gonna be social. You think? It's it's one hundred percent gonna be social. Um, in what way? How is AR gonna affect your with your phone socially? Uh, it's going to be putting avatars onto onto your desk. 
if you're already holding your phone out yeah. and doing FaceTime or whatever your voice chat is and you're seeing someone's face, yeah. it's much more immersive if it looks like it's a pass-through camera and that it looks like a hologram behind your world because it keeps you anchored to your world too. Okay, we'll see. I don't know. I think I might just rather see FaceTime. Rather just see the face. Yeah. The thing that, I, that I've been most compelled by is the... Uh, the measurement I- tools? The, the Ikea stuff. Yeah. Like where you can actually put furniture into your space and see right. what it would look like at scale. Right. Yeah. That's neat. Uh, and then one last bit of uh, news. Uh, what's your streaming device of choice? I have the Roku. I have I have multiple Rokus in my house. Are and, you and a- Jeremy? A- Apple, Apple TV. TV. I, I'm a, I'm, I use both. I use Roku in the bedroom and Apple TV in the living room. And Roku is the by far the top streaming device it owns about 30 percent of the market and that seems to be growing according to some industry analysis what is also interesting is where their growth is coming from is at the cost of apple so yep. apple's market has decreased the most of its other competitors which are amazon and google and then there's like some smaller ones right. too it's not cheap either it's 80 bucks for the new roku you can get a real cheap roku i think you the, can the 37 percent market share they have is between all rokus things built in tvs okay yeah. and uh the roku sticks which are real cheap yeah 30 bucks and uh i think this doesn't bode well for the next Apple TV. No. The expectation is that there will be there will be a high end 4K Apple TV, but I think because they don't control the distribution channels and all people want to watch is Netflix, HBO, yeah. Hulu, and that's on the cheapest thirty dollar device, the good enough 1080p device. The, the other thing Roku has done is I think all the other makers, especially Apple, has been like, here's a single box, and you know that's what this you is get. the only way for you to yeah Roku is come up with five different models like you can have the stick you can have like a 720 you can have a 1080 you can have an ultra 4k hdr for the high-end users so they're servicing different elements of the marketplace uh and then they've been iterating faster their next generation product they've been coming out with products every year apple's been a lot slower on that and then amazon's products have some walled garden kind of mentality to them they work a lot better with Amazon Video. Uh, and so that limits certain things. And Google's trying to do the same thing and emphasizing Chromecast. So I think Roku's in this interesting place. How are how have they not been bought? Like hmm. Roku? Yeah. They they were originally started from Netflix. No, I mean, but somebody, one of these big guys, Definitely. I would like Apple has a little bit of cash. As I don't we know. think they're interested in that. It's a completely different type of But then you go from like 20% market share to 50 overnight. The, the the company that would be in the best position to buy Roku, if Roku wanted to be in sale, would be a TV maker. Uh, so when you buy something on Roku, is, does it go into your Google Play account? Uh, you can buy from different services. So basically, Roku is just a it interface. Yeah, yeah. But on so, top of all of the other, so you can buy straight straight from Amazon. You can buy mm-hmm. Amazon. You can buy from you know anywhere. That you buy stuff. Not Apple. And what, I mean, it just has unified search. So it'll search all of the things. What I like is it'll do a little cost comparison. When you're renting movies, mm. you can look for a movie and you see on Vudu it's three bucks, on Amazon it's five, and then you can choose which one to actually pay for. I had the first one. Mm-hmm. Like that was my first Roku, and I never went up from there. Yeah, it, it definitely is. The UI has improved a lot. Cool. Um, I think uh, you're right. It was the it was the first. Uh, it, it wasn't owned by Netflix. Though. It was a spinoff. What? Netflix what? had entertained the idea of making a dedicated box. They said, "Let's not do this. It's not the way the business model is. Yeah. We want to be in every device." And so the people working at Netflix on making Netflix box spun off and oh, made Roku. I did not know that. I thought they just licensed the ability to stream from Netflix. Didn't realize they were seated there. Cool. Uh, I think that's it for technology news. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, I want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode of The Only Test, and that's Legal Zoom. You know, something I think about a lot is death, but I still don't have my own will. And it is uh, the National Make a Will Month at Legal Zoom, so now might be the time to take control of your family and your assets. Preparing for your family's future is the most important thing you might do this summer. So there's a lot to think about. That's why LegalZoom has created an estate planning kit to get you going. So you can go to LegalZoom.com slash prepare to get this free kit. You get a ton of helpful info plus LegalZoom discounts. And they designed this kit to provide you the tools, all the tools you need in just one place, whether it's a will or a trust.
trust that's right for you. Uh, you'll also get special discounts on how to plan one, plus an estate plan checklist, an ebook, and other info to help you decide. There are only a few days left in this nat- national make a will month. So hurry up and go to legalzoom.com slash prepare to check it out right now. There's no obligation, just great resources to help you protect everything you care about. That's legalzoom.com slash prepare. It's time for a moment of science. Now, obviously, we we have um, not talked about the big events of this week, which is what's happening in Houston and in Texas with the incredible flooding there. Uh, there's been incredible acts of heroism that have emerged from that community as now what, what has happened is the largest rainfall event in United States history, as long as our records go back. Um, I'm has or has occurred at, at least when I looked a, a day or so ago, they had passed um, over 50 inches That's in a number of places. Insane. Uh, like they gotten four feet of rain in less than uh, a oh. week, and uh, that number could go up in certain localized areas up to to 60 inches, which is just an enormous amount of water. Now, um, there's there's so much nonsense out there ab- ab- about this. People fighting sort of over the politics of it. Uh, push that aside because I think there's incredible um, heroism happening. But there's also some interesting science to discuss. Um, Last year, ProPublica, which is an investigative reporter outlet, did a huge story on Houston because Houston has actually suffered a number of floods in recent times. And that's not an area that you would normally associate with a flood. It's, you know, even though it's along the Gulf Coast, it's not like there is... Uh, it's not exposed to the ocean. It's not exposed to huge surges. The Gulf is relatively calm, excepting sort of hurricane season. Um, and what they found is Houston, have, for, have either of you been to Houston? Yeah, I went to JSC. No. I mean, it's a big, it's a four, first of all, it's the fourth largest city in the country, which people don't necessarily not just associate. Land area. Yeah, and, and population too. Oh, okay. um, and so it is a big urban sprawl in the same way that, that Los Angeles is. Uh, But it sat on an area that used to be populated by prairie, and it had a lot of these tall grasses. And and when I say tall grasses, so above ground, they might be like a few feet, but the roots would extend down uh, 10 feet. So these would be like 15 feet uh, of sort of uh, prairie. And uh, Texas had, especially in the Houston area, a uh, environment that allowed a lot of unregulated sort of zoning. So a lot of buildings went up in areas without sort of regulations about putting prairie back into that place. Flood, and there was sort of a floodplain here that was sort of associated with seagrass. And when we use the word floodplain, which you might hear a lot, it's actually more of an insurance word than it is a science word. So scientists and engineers go through using historical data and map out where floods have occurred. And when you hear a word like a hundred year flood zone or a hundred year floodplain, it really just means you have a 1% chance of having a flood in that area. Right. And so that's how they use to cal- that they use that information to calculate flood insurance rates. And if you live in a hundred year flood zone, most people get flood insurance. And then there's a 500 year flood zone, which means one in 500 chance of doing that. Well, that's what- a, bad name then yeah it's a terrible it name it's a total sense. weird misnomer yeah um and so i have a map up on my screen and i'll put it in the show notes um from this pro publica piece where they mapped flooding that's happened over the last 10 years in houston versus the floodplains and they found a majority of homes that have been flooded in areas that have been flooded are happening outside those floodplains hmm. which is a problem right like why is there flooding occurring where it shouldn't be occurring a lot of it has to do with the prairie grass being removed and probably some impacts of, of climate change as well. Uh, so there was uh, a couple floods in 2015 and 2016 uh, and some interesting um, interviews with people that have had their homes flooded like three times in the last seven years. Uh, and what's going on? And uh, it it's sort of this fascinating take about urban planning, the combination of floodplains moving because of climate change, uh, and uh, how we design these sort of uh, uh, environments so that they can have natural sort of defense systems. So 
um, a lot of the building developers build these retention ponds in behind their their units, They're like literally a pond that would like suck up water. But those aren't as, according to the scientists in the area that are experts on it, those aren't as effective as the prairie grass that was there initially. So, um, oop, <laughs> I knocked over a bunch of stuff here. Sorry. Uh, a lot of the scientists have have come out and and been very vocal that. Houston's not designed well for floods. Now you have this incredible storm that has all of these things that no one could predict, like a, a hurricane basically stalling over a major U.S. city uh, for an extended period of time. By the way, I heard some interesting science about that, mm-hmm. was that, that that there's so much water now on the ground that it created a reciprocal relationship with the clouds, and it acted like an ocean. Yeah, it, that uh, that's totally true. Like I, I think the estimates were like, 14 trillion gallons of water has fallen in that area, wow. which is double what Katrina um, had and, and for New Orleans, which we, I think, largely consider one of the worst natural disasters in our lifetime. Uh, so this is a really complicated uh, situation, but I'll put a link to this ProPublica um, study because it has all of these incredible detailed maps of Houston and the urban sprawl and how they have to kind of combat this because... This isn't just a Harvey situation. This is going to go on for years and years and years. We just don't hear much about the floods that were happening uh, in 2016 and 2015 because they aren't nearly as catastrophic. But there's people living in there's millions of people living in zones that are going to be prone to floods for decades to come. All right. On a on a happier note or just a different note. I mean, we had a little without spoiling Game of Thrones a little bit, but let's talk about cold. Winter is here, so we got to talk a little bit about this. Scientists broke a record last week for the coldest molecule ever. They got a molecule down to uh, uh, tens of millionths of a degree above zero. Like we're Abs- talking absolute zero, a- absolute zero. So uh, traditionally, we've been able to get uh, molecules down to millionths of a degree. Uh, using lasers basically you shoot a laser at a molecule and it absorbs this photon and it ends up cooling down it's sort of laser trapping is what it's called now they got something down i I apologize it's 50 trillionths of a degree by using a combination of that laser cooling where you shoot a laser at a molecule in this case it's a calcium monofluoride molecule so it, it cools down, and then they create a laser trap by shining two lasers at the same time that collide to each other, and they create this little like wake that's almost like an uphill. So as the molecule is in that area, it sort of like rolls against the laser, How do and you all of its that? all of its heat gets tra- yeah is trapped that into is it. that temperature actually measured, or is that just uh, calculated as an estimate? Uh, they measured that degree. Um, there's some calculations that happen. <laughs> what? Wow. Well, why can't we reach absolute zero? Well, just because like all molecules have some innate vibrational components to them. You can't stop it. You can't stop a. You can't stop molecules from being molecules. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, and in terms of applications, I don't think any. But this is cool. Last one, just pure fun. Uh, SoftBank, who bought uh, Boston Dynamics last year, they're a Japanese financial company, but also a robotics maker. They own Pepper, which is that sort of self-described, sort of emotionally intelligent robot that you've probably all seen. Well, a group in Japan is now repurposing Pepper to deliver funeral rites. Whoa. It's programmed. Oh, Japan. <laughs> okay. Jerry. It's programmed. <laughs> covers his eyes, shaking his head. <laughs> why, it's why, why? It's programmed to be a Buddhist priest. There's a shortage of Buddhist priests because the there aren't that many um, opportunities. So uh, there there is a shortage of Buddhist priests. So they reprogrammed Pepper to be able to deliver last rites. And you can do it for a quarter of the price of a normal funeral. You know, that I can see. I can see how a Buddhist would be cool with that. I think that's where it ends. I also could see how if I were to be hit by a bus, people in my life might say, that seems like something he would want. (laughs) But it's not. Let me go on record. You don't have to say anything at my funeral, but don't have a robot talk. (laughs) Whoa. Whoa. Hot take. The VR Minute. 
virtual reality this week. All right, I think we got to start off the segment by talking about Windows Mixed Reality, or for, actually, why we shouldn't call this Windows Mixed Reality. <laughs> we have to. It's what they're calling no, it. No, no, we don't have to at all. Windows, Microsoft has its own VR initiative, and it's peculiar. Now, the name is peculiar. The, <laughs> not only the name peculiar, but like we, our expectation was such that when, for example, when Microsoft said that the Xbox Scorpio, before it was known as the Xbox One X, it would use it would be VR compatible. A lot of assumption was that they would partner because they had an existing partnership with Oculus. They yeah. put Xbox One controllers in all the original Rifts that came out. So and and obviously the Rift is a um, runs on the Windows platform. I so still really, have I still have to believe that was on the table. That, yeah. So we had a lot of hope that the Rift would. The Facebook and Oculus would, or Facebook and Microsoft would come into a partnership yeah. to have maybe better, better integration, and uh, but that's not the Microsoft way. Uh, the Microsoft way is apparently create a standard and then let all of its OEMs make whatever they want oh. and to try to build a big. It's what they've done with with Windows since the beginning of Windows, right? So we had seen these headsets in renders, and we'd actually used some of them before, uh, some of the prototypes are out, but we have more details now, and it's going to be maybe a big launch for this holiday. They're calling it Windows Mixed Reality. It's really VR. This is Microsoft's VR play, which is to create a standard and to have let its partners, whether it's Lenovo, Dell, Acer, um, and, or Asus, release their own headsets that have these standards, and also have track controllers, and then build the software layer on top of Windows 10 to execute applications or to run Steam VR. Interestingly, like these standards you mentioned, I think they are requirements. Like I don't think they're min specs. I think you have to adhere to a certain resolution. Oh, so it's not there. You can't go above them. I don't think so. Now the question for me is that because so many of these headset makers are OEMs, they don't have the same. Like HTC was able to build the Vive because they had extensive relationships with uh, display makers, yeah. right? And if there's a long, it was, it's not easy to make a VR headset that has all these protocols and all and all these specs, min, min, min specs. Um, if Oculus had to work with Samsung for their displays. And, uh, so is Microsoft providing the hardware and then letting the manufacturers, these OEMs right. rebrand or the, or each of these OEMs, ha- they actually have to source the own their own hardware to meet these min specs. I think it's closer to the former. What does Nvidia do? Nvidia doesn't do anything. No, they just but make they, the they, hardware, they, or they make the graphics cards. Right, I know, but they have all the third parties that actually brand them. Do they provide any silicon, the, the actual hardware, or do all the third parties just take the, the just components? Make the PCBs. The, the yeah. chips are all made by Nvidia. Okay, so the the providers make the basically like the the circuit boards. Mm-hmm. But well, Nvidia also has reference boards. Yeah, exactly. And that, so they just that get people copied. can rebrand. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe it's the same kind of thing. This I think this is closer to that. It's actually a really good analogy. Uh, but we now know more about these headsets. Right, so mixed reality uh, will have these headsets have uh, 90 hertz, which makes sense. Oh, that's great. 1440 by 1440 displays in each is it each uh, each eye. I want to say, uh, yeah, each eye 1440 by 1440. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, and they all have inside out tracking with two cameras. Yeah, the inside out tracking is pretty cool. Uh, so the no external sensors. Yeah, no lighthouse, no cameras needed. Now. It's cool in terms of how easy it is to, to use without yeah. additional setup, one USB cable, uh, just a display cable, but how good is that compared to having even just optical camera setup? Right, because that's what we don't know. Latency is crucial. Not just latency, but accuracy. Well, like, yeah. Right? yeah. And if we're talking about the room mapping, like maybe it's going to be better suited for certain types of room environments. Um, I, I think that there's no question that that's the way it's heading. Like everybody's going to get there. And it's like everything else we talked about in the show, like Elon Musk with the cars. It's like if you can nail optical, it's possible. You it, just have to get the R and D in there. You just get the compute. Compute's always going to go faster. Yeah, it's going to be low. And these are all tethered headsets, and the algorithms will always get better. And these will be learning. Maybe for the first couple months, first week, you know, you're not gonna. It's not gonna track your room. But if you're using in the same room all the time, yeah, it's gonna be good enough for the vast majority. And it's also versatile in terms of other objects coming into the room, animals coming into the room. You don't have to track things put trackers on things as much 
uh, if you don't need to know uh, pixel precision That's interesting. for that stuff, right? You need you do need the pixel precision for your hand controllers and the things that you want in game, but the things in your world environments where your keyboard is, where uh, where the, your cat's running around, right? That stuff. As long as you have the extra compute, yeah, um, you can give rest. You can have you can have variable uh, chaperone style boundaries. Even is there any kind of camera pass through system? So that's I don't think so. No, it the really, cameras, yeah. the two cameras are just for their inside out tracking. Calling so it mixed mixed reality. That's Im- that's misleading. That. Yeah. yeah. So the they will be available this holiday season. Pricing has been announced. It's three hundred dollars just for the headsets and four hundred dollars for the headsets plus these controllers, which you know they look like they look like a mix between the touch controllers and the. Um, the the Vive wands knuckles the the Vive wands even oh, you, you think hold so? them like wands oh but they have the ring like yeah. the touch control yeah you need you do need the ring, uh, and they're IR blasters they're the IR emitters but they're the tr- controllers must be tracked by just the headset they are and that's my biggest concern you can't you can't sh- hold guns behind your back now granted you can't see them when they're behind your back so, so all you what need is, is it, rotation you might think what does it matter but a lot of times what makes vr so compelling is that you can be firing in a direction a mm-hmm. pistol for instance in space private trainer and looking in the opposite direction well have the imu sensor at least so have the rotational tracking it just won't have the positional tracking that's not enough and it's also not enough for social if other people need to see what your hands are doing when exactly. they're out of your own field of view yeah so i wonder like this is my biggest concern about this platform yeah fingers uh, crossed but it's a re- it may be a really cheap way not only to get into windows and microsoft's own windows mr interface uh, that this uh this living room setup they have but also steam vr because these headsets will work with Steam VR, that's 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 huge because that, that that's yeah absolutely that's huge. your games library. Plus, right. they're not forcing you to use the Windows Store. No, so thank goodness. Right, so this is a very it feels like a very Windows inner way to, to approach VR, and where they're going to make, make their own platform, maybe port some games over and sell you stuff on that. But also, I mean, Steam has been open about letting people with Rifts use use Steam VR, and um, yeah, I mean, it'll be it's gonna be tough for developers because Why? You, I mean, there's some limited parity. Right? Yes. But you can't design a game where you need to have motion tracking without looking at objects. Like, I know. And, you know, and like there will be some diminished gameplay experiences. Remains to be seen. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the vast majority of the VR experiences that have that use touch interfaces, they are in front of you. And whether it's a shooter yeah. or or a, a, a content creation app, you are looking at what your hands are doing. But when it, like social is a huge part of, of VR and with motion controllers included, and like you said, it's gonna be, you're gonna get some weird results if hands are doing something weird because your headset can't see them. Yeah, uh, and you know, I mean, Microsoft also has Minecraft. Their killer app here potentially is Minecraft in VR, like a really good version of Minecraft. And Minecraft is building blocks in front of you. Yeah. Four hundred dollar headsets may work with some laptops in the future, depending on the the uh, the, the specs. Um, and also, they did promise a, a Halo game in VR. Ooh. What I mean, they, I don't. Think, how much did they promise? <laughs> Full game, <laughs> like side quest. Who knows? Yeah, don't know. I mean, that potentially, if it's an FPS, that could be huge. Yeah, and they're it, letting they're t- also piggybacking on a lot of these interesting solutions um, that uh, for moving around. Um, I mean, just. Steal, steal ideas. This is what VR needs right now. Take ideas. The other developers, more developers, should be looking at what Ready at Dawn has been doing with Lone Echo and making more of these zero G crawling flight you know, simulators. I was thinking about that. And by the way, I don't know if it has to be zero G. Like I was at first, I thought, well, maybe this is the template, but maybe it's just that movement. Maybe it's just the swinging, the one to one, and then you let go and there's momentum. Like you could be, imagine like a hover junkers where the you move well, by you need, grabbing the world. Zero G gives you, uh, and also robot strength gives you a lot of power. So yeah. it's it's one to one in the initial movement, but you have a direct sense of how, f- like how much you can actually vault yourself. Right. And if you can can't vault yourself very far, like in the real world, I couldn't vault myself that far. Then, then make there no friction. I'm just saying that it, maybe you could do it on, on a plane, and it could right. be it could be like a it doesn't have to be zero G. You just swing yourself. Like the the crucial part about reducing motion sickness is the one to one propelling and mm-hmm. then letting go and then it be a smooth motion. See, so th- that's the hulking mechanism. 
You're just talking about the hulking thing. Like when you steer the world? The, yeah. Like, the hulking and, and pulling, but the same way. Right. Like hulking and, and pulling yourself around the world. Yeah, but I'm saying let go and let yourself continue, maybe with no resistance. And then to stop, you just grab the world again. But you need to actually grab a real object in the world and not just an arbitrary break. I don't know about that. Like I would be curious to test that. Maybe it's not the fact that you're grabbing a block or a wall. Maybe but that gives you the, the, the connection to that virtual world. I know, world. but maybe like as you – like maybe there's this – array of like invisible cubes in the world that and you're in the holodeck and it maybe can be fantasy or air brakes okay and that's i mean i, I guess uh, L- uh, lone echo does use air brakes i think lone echo has discovered a, sh- a wonderful thing i just thinking it may not be the only solution uh speaking of pricing you know we talked about the the big price drop for the vive last week and a random anecdote my, my brother bought a, he got into VR because I've been telling him that you should try VR, you should try VR. Yeah. Uh, and he had not used VR, he'd, but he's on Reddit a lot. He had the perception before that he needed to buy the Vive. The Vive was the only way he could get room scale experience. He doesn't even have a 15 foot by 15 foot okay. play area. Well, so hold on. How does your brother never try VR? Because he doesn't live where I live. Do you have a VR headset? That, uh, you do at home? Oh, yeah, of course, course you do. This is weird. Okay, second question is, where did he get this information that he needed a Vive? From yeah, was friends. he on our Vive? And that's why? I think, from, I think there is a real still, there is a, a barrier, a per, perception-wise, that because Vive was first with room scale, yeah. that you're going you're gonna to always have an inferior... And uh, track controllers. And track controllers. You're going to have an inferior experience with anything else. And technically, yeah, you can have a much bigger play area with the two lighthouses yeah. if you have the space to support it. For the right game, Vive is a better totally, experience totally. by far. But Interesting. For the price, and if you're just going to be playing, like if you're if, and you can play Steam VR games, like there's it's, it goes back to the the good enough right now. It's great enough right now at the price. Oculus Rift. Yeah. Yeah. And so you I, I told him to get the Rift because I, I, there was a great Newegg deal and he got one bucks. for about four hundred, little under four hundred bucks, and he was blown away. Cool. And I think it's good. I mean, I'm not. It's not saying one is better than the other or what you should get right now, but it goes to the point that there's a lot of people who have opinions about VR who haven't used it yet, mm-hmm. and the only way to get around that is to get people to use VR. You know, use a Rift, use a Vive. But like use try it all, and this is why those stores having like the Microsoft stores having the Best Buy kiosks are so important. And I know they're expensive to set up, um, but go to a friend's house and use VR before you make a decision. Or your brother's house. Or your brother's house. Ah, mm. you, you, not not welcome <laughs> in my house. Um, we played some uh, a new Rec Room quest last night. Uh, thank you, Rec Room, for making us another quest. I, I love it. This it, is such a great business model. You it's know, one making of the, no money, there's no business. For, for the fans. It's one of the best social experiences in VR, too. It, in yeah, well, in it, terms of social gameplay experiences. It's free. It's, it's free. So there's it's always easy people. to jump into. Yeah. And the, the quests are a little bit like silly, and they give you enough action, but enough pauses to also just chat with each other along the way. Yeah. So this is another medieval theme one. And something I remarked when we were playing last night is that the they've really stepped up um, how detailed the world is. Now it still is a like it's still theme looks like rec room. It's still in a like a like a revamped school. It looks like the the you know the the drama club has set dress their hallways, but it's much more elaborate than the first rec room. It's that school has yeah. a huge budget. Yeah, the drama department. Yeah, it still looks like cardboard cutout trees and everything, mm-hmm. uh, and the bad guys are all on ropes that are being pulled up yep. to the rafters. Yeah, but. Uh, it's super fun. I mean, it's yeah. they've added a new weapon, so you can, there's almost like a, a wizard now who holds a fire. Work. It's a Roman candle kind of. Yeah, like a Roman candle that you, operates you, like a shotgun. I guess so. Yeah, and it's sort of widespread. But then there's bows and a crossbow, and then your standard melee weapons with a sword and a shield. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, we, I mean, we, nothing else to say about it. I right? don't know how far we got. We we made it all the way through to um this big a pretty big boss, and we were excited by that and norm said this is better than game of thrones <laughs> um, i said it facetiously we yeah. fought a, we fought a dragon it was a good moment but the dragon killed us yeah i mean that's, that's probably how it should go so here's a question i have for you yes they're introducing new um combat mechanics right but most the core game the moving around is the same since the first rec room quest came out yeah. you know even that short six month period for us playing 
the, the, these games, mm-hmm. you know, new experiences like like movement in Lone Echo has come out. Do you feel like the game is being held back by some of its core VR mechanics? Teleportation. Yes. Or do you think that like that's that's due for an update, or do you feel like it's not? I don't want them to add Lone Echo style, tra- um, you know, translation. What do we call it? Um, movement into rec room. No, I don't need that. I, I think the the changing environments and the changing weapons are enough to keep me happy. So you're saying so, it reached that minimum bar. You, we get a sense of like moving around is totally fine. Uh, it is a limitation, but the social aspect, the fun of the social aspect, the fun of that questing is good enough that it can be quote unquote dated. Uh, it doesn't even be the cutting edge um, mechanic, but it's still no, compelling. Yeah, 100%. I mean, yeah. people settled on teleportation for a reason. It, it works. I, I will say my favorite was still the previous one that had the 80s vibe and the laser weapons and Me too. stuff. Me too. Because it, w- it was so dynamically different. Um, than the previous one. So it also had just the most rich environment. The music was really good. I felt like it was a little harder too. Yeah, it w- I agree. Um, so I'm ex- I hope they keep doing this. I don't know if that's fair. I mean, I'm a sci-fi fan. So if you're gonna, if it's gonna be sci-fi, you already have a boost. Uh, one last bit of VR news, Zeiss. Now Zeiss, they're lens makers. They're, uh, they make camera lenses, optical experts. Microscopes. Mm-hmm. And they did have like a, a, a VR, like a, like a phone-based VR solution, right, where you put a phone in and, and you could use some apps. Uh, they announced that they have a new VR. This is interesting. This is a VR streaming solution. They're calling this the Zeiss VR One Connect. So it's a mobile VR headset, but you will let you will be able to stream Steam VR onto your mobile headset. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Not much to say about that. Like, it's basically Steam Link for VR. Yeah, I get you. It's, I mean, I guess if there's no, there's a lot of questions, right? Latency, mm-hmm. it, it, I don't know about that. That You can't have it. So how do you do that? And, they, that, and, and uh, whether this mobile um, headset, because you're still putting your phone on the headset, will have positional tracking. Ugh, yeah. And they, they have wireless controllers with Bluetooth, but... Uh, whether the Bluetooth controllers will have um, will have more than just IMU tracking. Yeah. There's, so so yeah. there is, yeah, there is three degrees of movement, but it's not six degrees of movement. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious p- trying it out. St- wireless, it's wireless, which is the big deal, right? It's streaming mm-hmm. wireless. And at some point, streaming wireless, rendering something locally on your computer and streaming it over, whether it's a... a, a Next gen you know, IP a digital protocol or something that's an analog signal, or in the, in the you know fifty gigahertz frequency, uh, is going to be a solution for for high end gamers. It's going to be a solution relatively soon. I mean, with with uh, with the release of uh, TV Cast in the impending future. Mm-hmm. If you enjoy the VR stuff, uh, there's more that we can't talk about because we're under embargo. But please tune into projections this week, uh, which should be coming out uh, what Friday or so. Friday, Friday, 8 a.m. And we'll, we'll be talking about some cool new stuff. Awesome. And uh, let's go to our last segment. Okay, well, that's called testing, right? Oh, testing. check this out. <laughs> wow, that was weird. Testing. Uh, check this out. Test it. What we've been testing. Hey, what have you guys been testing? How about it's that? different. Yeah. Eh, I like the old one better. Okay. Let's play the old one. Testing <laughs> this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Yeah, it's better. Hey, what have you guys been testing? <laughs> I've been testing face paints and makeups, uh, especially the ways to set them and uh, and to be in a makeup for an extended period of time without sweat and other um, elements removing it. It's been an interesting lesson in chemistry. I went and actually took a, uh, a mini class in... Uh, in makeup chemistry at um, a place in town. Why I'm forgetting the name. Makeup chemistry. Yeah. Hmm. There's a whole like science to to makeup. Is makeup chemistry a real science? Yeah, hmm. it is. Like all of, all of that work that that you see um, Frank doing is based on on science and chemistry. So 
uh, I took a class that was really eye opening. I'm forgetting the name. Cryolon. That's the place I took a class, um, which is this, uh, you know, kind of a special effects makeup uh, company here, local in San Francisco. It was one of the best uh, little classes I've taken. How about that? Very cool. Uh, you're going to talk about this, right? I'm going to talk about a couple things. Uh, one, uh, there's a new 360 camera I've been testing. It's a Insta 360 One. Um, it's it's a like a 4K two lens system. Does some stitching built in. Um, I think they it's available now. Um, let me quickly check the price point. Um, but something that it introduced me to this is like a an, uh, unlike the Samsung Gear 360 that we had last year. This thing connects to your phone. So it looks more oblong-like. It's not like a, a sphere. And it has a, a lightning cable, and you plug in your phone. It's 300 bucks, and it does 4K stitching with photos, 24 megabit uh, pixel stills. Um, and does it have to plug into your phone? No, you don't have to. It has local storage, too. The phone okay. only gives you real-time viewing. Okay. So the Gear one actually only worked with the, the Samsung phones, and you had to use a uh, wireless connection for uh, the viewing. Um, one of the features that allows you to do is this, what are they calling it? It's a, it's a, like a, a, a bullet time camera. So you showed me a video last week, Jeremy, where someone took their iPhone. It was, I think it was a GoPro. No, it was an iPhone. Was it? Because it was 240 FPS. That's crazy. Took their iPhone shot in 240 FPS and swung it around themselves with a rope. While skiing. While skiing. Down a hill. And the video looked amazing. Other YouTubers have now taken this idea and done amazing things. Because like, you, the fact that, that you can slow down reality to about 10 times, right? 24 FPS to 240 FPS. But when you're swinging, the, uh, the centrifugal um, the force keeps the phone out. And if you're doing a really cool activity, whether it's skiing or some linear activity, you can see it from all sides. Now, Insta360 is allowing you to do that, but with a 360 camera. So you have stabilization already in the fact that you're shooting 360, but now you can look in, that one camera is always gonna look in on you, the subject, doing something crazy as you're spinning this camera around. Mm -hmm. But because you can experience it while wearing a headset or in a, in a YouTube video, you can also then look around. Mm -hmm. um, but so when you, d I don't want to spin around and have my, I want to always have my perspective facing the same direction when I'm spinning. Right, is right. It, so the camera's not going to spin around you. The view, if you're wearing a headset, it's not going to spin around you. You're always going to look at the center. I am? I don't want to do that. I always want to look right. I don't want to look in the center. I'll go sick. No, but if you have a, a subject to focus on in the center, and it's moving at high speed, or it's moving at slow motion because it's filming in high speed, yeah. but you're slowing it down, mm -hmm. it's not going to give you motion, motion okay. sickness because I mean, you have a fixed point. Is this for VR at. or 360 video? I think it's for 360 video. All right, in that case, there's no motion sickness to begin with. Yeah, but okay. you could experience it in VR if you wanted to. I think it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Have you tried that? I have not done the swing. Okay, but you've, you've tried taking photos? Yes, photos and video. And, and the image quality, stitching is good. It is? I mean, there's still, you can see the barrier. Okay. You can see where the line is. You can like hide, the, you, know, you put your face in there, your hand there. Like it's gonna be a thing where you want to optimize for where the front is. But the there's front, the just back. one barrier. Just like, one barrier. It's not like normal arrays where you get five or six barriers. Right, right. It's the same with the Gears 362. It's with two lenses. Yeah. It's just the the one barrier. And how, yeah. how much is cut off? Like, do you lose anything? You do lose it. it the the matching isn't perfect. You do lose like I don't know if it's a degree or two degrees okay. or something. Oh. Yeah. Um. And then uh, the other thing I've been testing is the structure sensor, the newest version of the structure sensor. We talked about this uh, a couple years ago. Will brought it, actually. Um, Occipital is the name of a, a company that makes this depth sensing camera. And this is before there was AirKit, before we really had any type of consumer s room scanning or object scanning technology. It has two lenses on it? Two lens, A laser and, uh, and, and, uh, and laser. one lens. Um, class one laser. Is it is a laser? It's a class one laser. Laser beam. Um, and it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, they bought a company called Scanact, um, and it's a software. It's GPU accelerated, so it's actually you're doing depth sensing, and that's being beamed up wirelessly over your local Wi-Fi to your desktop computer or laptop. Your own cloud. And your yep. And uh, doing your GPU processing, you walk around a subject or an object, and it gives you a model with vertices and faces that's 
in the millions of polygons. So can we talk about your scan? Yeah. So it's not as high detailed as like the thirty thousand uh, dollar laser scanners or, or photogrammetry scanners that we've used with um, Artec, uh, but uh, Jeremy's holding up a three D print of Danica that I scanned and printed in scanned in like ten minutes, and this is a nine hour print. Um, now I know like three D prints take away a little bit from the fidelities. Mm-hmm. So as, as much fidelity as I see here tells me that the scan is very good. Yes, yeah. I and can t- I can recognize who Danica. Is. Like not I mean everything about her facial expression mm-hmm. is yeah. there. The ridges in the hoodie that she's wearing, including the hood. Yeah, the hood on the back especially, which has all of these folds. Yeah, and, and the hair is really really strong. Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, and that's still. Uh, reduced in polygons because what they give you is way more detail and it's not it's a lot of noisy detail that you would need for a 3d print yeah Uh, because the resolution isn't for the depth camera isn't as high resolution as like like those other artex scanners the thirty thousand dollar professional scanners right and and for comparison this is a scan of joey that we did a few years ago ahead of a tested live show and while i think you can tell at a distance that it's joey you lose a lot of the the facial features and detail, um, uh, especially uh, uh, around like the chin and mouth area. Uh, it's so impressive how quickly this technology has moved forward. Yeah, I so, mean, it's a, and is, is it commercially available already? Totally, it's been commercially available for a while. The improvements they've made, I think they've made some improvements to the hardware, but mostly it's software that's been upgraded. Um, it, since we use it a couple, three years ago now. Uh, they also have a new app called Canvas that I've, I'm going to test, and it's, gonna, it's a room mapping. Um, so it gives you, like, you can scan your room, and then you get to measure distances. It's for you know, architects and designers. It's like the the next version, next level of that IKEA place your furniture app. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I talk real quickly about what I've been working on? Yeah. Do we have yeah. time for that? Yes, yes. So... Um, for the for the next upcoming episode of Bits to Adams and it involves which is our uh, the show that I do with Sean Charlesworth uh, about making things and modifying things uh, we are modifying a, a pinball machine and I and I took the signal from these lamps in a pinball machine and I wanted to make them trigger something else I won't spoil anything but that was hard man it was really really hard it dri- drove me crazy I worked so long on this I ended up using a new circuit that, or a new um, chip that I'd never used before called an opto isolator, which, which is a wonderful little thing uh, that is basically like it takes a signal and it converts it into a clean signal. And uh, so that's what I've been testing. However, once I got that done, it still, it still wasn't working right. All this noise still was coming through these false positives, it drove me crazy, ended up pushing it through an Arduino and doing some code to filter everything out. Um, so that that's what I've been working on is cleaning up pinball circuits so that you can control other things with them. It's pinball signals to whatever you want. Now this is this is potentially kind of neat. You could, mm-hmm. if you could take this and like plug in to a light that gives you information about extra ball maybe or whatever you want and then you could like relay that to the cloud. Like you could start reading. Jeremy has an extra ball. I just got to push a notification exactly. to my phone. Like, you know, <laughs> or maybe for operators, like you notice something's wrong. Like you could start reading these things, reading information just from the lamps themselves. But it's it's one pinballs. direction. You're not sending information back. No, it is one direction. Yeah. But it's a way that you just start to start to think about, you know, how could you apply this to the, uh, to Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> New high score. <laughs> exactly. All right, awesome. And you can find that on the site. Um, we have a couple other things going up uh, this week. There's a new episode of Projections up tomorrow, and I believe today Adam unboxes uh, um, the most um, a thing that blows his mind. I don't want to spoil it too much, uh, except that it's uh, it's an analog device that he uh, that it's one of his new favorite objects. All right. And uh, we have an outro this week by Joe L. All right. Hi there. I didn't see you. That's it. What did you think when you saw me? I thought it was stupid. Joel's on the list. Is that manufactured? I don't think I would have said that. That's mean. <laughs> Bye. Bye.